Hello there and welcome to the latest edition of Lunchtime Learning. I'm delighted to be joined and welcomed back by Matt Nickel, MD of Nickel & Co. The Sale Agency of the Year. I've given up on how many awards you've won. You're just exceptional at what you do. But congratulations. You, I, can see, I can see a few on the wall behind you though as well. So uh, I'm in good company. Yeah, you are. I'm trying to keep up with you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was that, that was the big one for us. That was um that was a big moment being down there in um in November and going away with the going with away with the award. It's quite a special moment for for me and some of the guys and the team back at the office. It was incredible. Oh, it, look, it's phenomenal. And you and I have known each other for quite a long time. And you know what you've done and consistently do is absolutely exceptional. And not only is it the culture, the community, there's so much that you do exceptionally well. So, you know, you are well deserving of that award. So congratulations. But for those for those of those that people that don't actually know who Nicole and Co are. So tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got in agency um, and how you got to the company where it is. Yeah. Um, so I've had the business now for 14 years, it'll be 15 years in October. Um, I worked for an independent before that I had five years working for a company called the Property Centre, who are a well-known local independent. Um, great time working with them. I kind of joined them as a junior negotiator. Ahead of that, I was working for my dad. He had a driving range in Birmingham and I used to sell tokens on the reception and do the food and beverages. Um, and it was around that time when Sarah Beanie was doing property redevelopment programs. And I thought, I want to get into property redevelopment. That's what I wanted to do. Um, so sat down, having a conversation with the old man. He said, you're not very practical. Why don't you get into it a different way? Why don't you go and learn what a good value property is? Why don't you learn the market? And that's kind of how it began. So that would have been 2004. As I said, five years at the property centre, which were great for me. I worked through from a junior all the way through the ranks, ran it for them through the recession, finished in profit. And I I thought then in 2009, as the market turned back on, it was the right opportunity for me to go and uh, go it alone in my hometown. Um, and yes, the rest is history, I suppose you'd say. Um, three offices now. So we're in Droitwich still. Um, we opened an office in Worcester, which is where my old stomp. Um, when I was working for the property centre and then we opened one in Malvern as well and we did that during the kind of the period of um, not lockdown necessarily but kind of that time when there was a bit of uncertainty because of Covid and all that went on with that but um, yeah we pinned our ears back and went for it and now we're into our third year and we're starting to see the fruits of our labour it's it's really starting to turn a corner for us there which is which is fab. Brilliant so let's go back junior property yes. centre to um you know making that um office profitable so what are the lessons there that you learn that you can share please so lessons i think there's no harm in doing every single job for every single person above you so we were back in the day we had one computer in the corner of the room and we had an a3 sheet viewings book we had an actual viewings diary um and i was getting feedback doing the viewings for everyone doing all their measure ups for them doing sales progression um, I don't take it for granted now, but I kind of I, I think that was a good footing for me to kind of learn those things. Um, actually, as I joined the company, within a couple of months, they decided to close an office. They had two offices in Worcester, which they've now gone back to having two offices. But they had two offices in Worcester and they um, they closed their St. John's office within literally three months. And we, opened, we joined. And I kind of thought, well, I'm lasting. I'm going to be first to go. And um, I remember the director saying, no, we, we, we've seen what we need to from you. We know we're going to back you and you'll be fine. So I stayed put. But um, I was often in first. I didn't do it for accolades or you know anything like that. But I just wanted to get set up. So I was in first. Often last to leave. Um, didn't have a wife. Didn't have children. So I was quite flexible, probably compared to my peers. And it just meant I could just just graft. I wanted to earn money. I had a nice car as a result. You know all those things. But um, it was something that I kind of I worked along this 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 route of being memorable for the right reasons. Then. It was always about making sure people aren't chasing me for updates. It was always about, you know, people coming to me when they needed help or advice. And even as a junior who hadn't even kind of bought a house at that point or gone through the emotions of buying a house, I felt just my service delivery and them knowing that I was grafting for them. They 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 just wanted to kind of keep using me and recommending me. So, yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a blur then the progression. So I became a value, as most people do. I was the main kind of listing agent in the office. And I think. In 2007, if the market was stronger, I probably would have gone then. But my directors took me for a curry and they said, look, the market's turning. You'd be daft to go on your own now. Why don't you stay with us? The position, I was an assistant manager then. They said the position for a manager role is going to be available because your existing manager wants to go to one of our other offices. So 
why don't you just stay and have the comforts for a little bit longer and, and that's what it was really so that was a good a good learning curve for me probably 25 or 23 24 left in 25 um it was a kind of been that age i've got no idea forget all the t i don't know how old i am now um but i was still, i was still young is my point no it would have been yeah it would have been around that age because i've been 19 years an agent so um it was it was a good time to kind of have the support we as a business they as the owners had to make decisions on the number of staff they employed which i had to, had a part to play in those decisions unfortunately i had to kind of say look i think that person needs to stay with us but that person's probably not pulling the weight but um it was all good stuff to do whilst you're with another employer as opposed to having to do that on your own so um they were fab for me you know really really strong years of my life and um and i still communicate with them and yeah i owe them a lot for my 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 start off in life brilliant so starting your own business obviously you knew people from the area going back to joy which going back to your hometown again people watching this are uh, thinking maybe you know i want to go i want to give it a go i want to be brave where do you find those new instructions how do you get hold of those people um i think for me it might have been slightly different back then um it was letting people know what i was doing i think probably that that, that is part of it you know communicating with those you've probably got your own little black book of people that you know that um would use you you're not going to take database from your um your current employer I chose I chose to go back to my hometown because I didn't want to step on anyone's toes. As I said, they were good to me as an employer. So I felt like I needed to go back to an area that I wasn't going to compete with them, but also obviously I had a, a good footing. I relied on my friends and it was brilliant to know the first couple of days. My first couple of inquiries came from um, friends of mine or their relations. Um, but to, to, to go it alone now, blimey. I think I'd, um, I'd, I'd probably make sure my social media presence was exceptional. Um, I'd work very hard probably on local things that I can help out with. You don't necessarily have to do it for gain, but just be invisible, just making sure that people kind of know who you are, where you are. Um, I suppose you're going to do the normal things like a press release and those bits and pieces that will just get a bit of visibility for you because some of the people that are looking to use an agent, they might not be looking on right move currently at who's selling stuff they could be looking for that new person that's um put a bit of a message out there in terms of how they're going to do things differently uh I, I did a flyer drop a very simple flyer drop and with a low budget did it with friends um and i still owe them probably a few drinks for all the results that that, that, <laughs> that got me but once you get your first couple of opportunities you just got to turn those into three more you've just got to make sure you really really work that market and um yeah it was a good 14 years ago now so i can't remember what else i did <laughs> I, I took a physical presence and I, I know probably a lot of agents nowadays would choose not to but i still firmly believe and um i i always invest in my shops that we have and then um, i still firmly believe having a physical presence is a, is a strong point in a town certainly like droid which or worcester or city of worcester or Melbourne itself it, having a physical presence has been has been important and um you've just done something to your shop window in worcester yes so we're on a main thoroughfare we're on the main road into worcester from droid which so you, if you're coming in from the north, then you kind of always come past our shop on Barbon Road. Um, and I had a relationship going back to my days when I used to be at Worcester Warriors and we used to advertise at Worcester Warriors. There was a company called LNX who um, I used to share a box with them because we advertised on the um, LNX signage, which is like you see in the football games, you know, where the, the repeat of the game is going and the scores and bits and pieces. And I reached out to him and I said, look, I don't I don't quite have a plan for this yet, but I don't want to put just a, win uh, a TV in my window. I want to go a little bit bigger and bolder. Is there anything you could do and they said come over and see us they're based in bromsgrove and um i could i could tell that i kind of i probably landed an idea in their head that they hadn't thought about as well so i explained we 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 spend a lot of money and we do a lot on our um, videography on our marketing we shoot lots of reels for our properties and it seemed just a waste just to put it onto social media one week and then it you know might pop up again in an algorithm but that's really it so it's about having the opportunity to, to show our clients stock a little bit more regularly and also show what we can do. So, yeah, we've now got um, a screen. It's essentially one and a half meters by one meter, but we've had to trim it in slightly so that not cut anything off, but just put some black um, LEDs down the side so that we actually we only have it to the format of what a phone shoots. So um, 16, nine dimensions. And that's so that they're perfectly square. You know, everything that we posted on social media is going on there properly. So 
it's it's gone down really well i've actually got planned application on the go at the moment in droit which so we're going to get one on the on the main main road heading out of droit which as well so we'll we're hoping to repeat the same thing here in droit which um and it'll give our give our clients great visibility it'll be great and you know another conversation start for our staff no doubt get us through a few more doors so yeah it's a, it's a good good move i think i hope good okay so coming back so gone you've gone from one office to two offices to three offices so what are the lessons that you've learned by um going from one to three lessons i've learned um i think it's important to keep your hand in um so today i've had one-to-ones with managers but i've also done some value training with another member of staff um so i think keeping your hand in being accessible um don't rush so the Malvern office Yes, we still did it during a kind of a time of flux, but we'd been looking for an office for about five years. So it kind of, I don't think it was a, or oh, maybe we should dip the toe. It was like, I, I was going to open an office in Malvern. The timing of what was going on in the world at the same time couldn't have stopped me because we'd found the location. Um, employ brilliant staff. Um, you, 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 do, you, you do need to have that comfort. You do need to have people that are engaged. You know, you've got to make sure that they, um believe in your culture they they trust and understand that you will be there for them but also they need to sometimes do it on their own and that might be tough conversations as well um i think the hardest thing is being accessible there's like 38 members of staff now so i can't i can't be there with everyone all the time but i've started doing a few different things so i record a tip every morning i do it on loom and i send that out at eight o'clock so when they go into their morning meeting they've got an update of what's going on in the market or a, a daily nugget of advice you know and i think hopefully that kind of means that whilst i can't be with them physically all the time i'm still having that little matt nickel influence on 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 their days and and how things are working bearing in mind a lot of my staff joined in the last two years so they've kind of joined in a market that's like sell everything you've got some duty incentives to really a tough market i've kind of had to make sure that they understand that the norm is kind of what we've experienced in the last year as opposed to the year before um and uh, yeah, that's, that's been a bit of a challenge in its own right. But they, they, they're better for it. Obviously, they're, they're good staff learning in this market. So, OK, so culture. I mean, mm. you create a good culture there. And, you know, I can see all the time. I think there was an announcement this morning about more promotions. And um, you see what you're, co- you're constantly doing there. How have you managed to create that culture? So back in 2020 before we went into the first lockdown i'd been reading the um traction book by gino wickman um so we have the um eos basically is is the way that we run our business um that's i think it's the entrepreneurs operating system and that for me has been a big part of it we do quarterly reviews so we're regularly checking in with our staff and going through kind of where the north star is for us what we're aiming for what we're up to um we also have a vision which is memorable for the right reasons as i've always already mentioned and we've got values that we stick to um i don't have the document but this goes back to my point about employing great staff we've got a manager one of my managers um over in the worcester office where his team have collectively come up with a document which is about their culture um we were talking about rugby before we came on and sir clive woodward who you mentioned you know teamship that kind of the team buy-in no point in me dictating what I want the culture to be in an office or in a department or in the business. It needs to be some kind of ownership from the staff. I think the staff feel like they can talk to me like it could be anything. It, it, it could be that they've got problems they need help with out, outside of work. But I'm, I'm, I'm an approachable young chap myself. You know, I say young. Um, I'm an approachable chap. I've, I've kind of got scar tissue, but I can I can help them um, with anything they need, basically. Um, and because we have values such as likable, dedicated, um, the likable is probably the most important one, if I'm honest with you, um, because you want to come into a place of work where you enjoy and you like working with the people around you. And, and those that don't fit that bit, they kind of stick out like a sore thumb and they and they don't tend to stay all that long. So, Where do you find these brilliant people? Um, I mean, we've we've had a few through the typical kind of process of Indeed. We've actually scoured for CVs and we have found people that have put their CVs on and approach them sometimes. Some of them have come from the automotive industry. 
Um, coming out of 2020, 21, there was a few local businesses that were, you know, making redundancies and bits and pieces. And people came from like the customer service side of things where ultimately they're probably dealing with stressed people, um, need the vehicle, something that they rely on. And obviously if it's been delayed because of parts and third parties, probably a tricky conversation to have. But um, yeah, some of our best staff have come from the automotive industry. And we've got, if you look at our team, if you look at the about us section on our on our um, website, you'll see quite a young force, really. We've got quite a young team. So trying to nurture mini Matt Nichols, probably just trying to bring him through the ranks and give him all that, all the experience. Although now they have the benefits of things like sales progression <laughs> members of staff, so they don't get to do all of it. But um, yeah, we try and try and get them to, to start at the bottom and work their way through. OK, so I know one of the things um, you looked at and I don't know if you're still doing it, but you had a retired solicitor going in um, and I don't know whether is that still happening or not, um, helping filling in all the fixtures and fitting forms, property information forms, sellers information forms. So I'm sure your days on market are considerably less than anybody else in your area. They are. They are indeed. Yeah, we've had to adapt that process. Um, it couldn't have lasted forever. He's, he's not very well blessed him. So. We've had to kind of adapt how we can do that. But again, that goes back to that point about staff members being used to doing it because it's about the process. It's, it, it, it was better having someone sat with them going through the forms, but it's more about getting vendors to start thinking at the very beginning, I do need to instruct a solicitor now, and I do need to get all that paperwork together because unfortunately, one of the reasons the transactions take so long is because it's a, it's a daunting prospect. It's not a job that people enjoy and they put it off. So instructing solicitors and taking a few days once the sale has been agreed, it does. It has a negative impact. Um, and we all know the quicker you can get a deal through, the more likely it is to, to go through in terms of success. Um, and it's the biggest battle. But, yeah, we're we're I think national average, you can probably tell me, is it 140 odd days now? I would have thought nationally we're, we're, we're sub 100. Um, it still feels like too long to me, but we are we are sub 100 and um the, the challenge is that we want to try and get it down to 85 days by the end of the year. I'm not too ambitious. I don't set ridiculous tasks. We do a lot of volume here. So, um, yeah, my, my ambitions for the team, for all departments, you know, to, to experience that kind of speed of transaction, get it down to 85 days if we can. OK, you spoke about marketing before. Um, so what sort of things have you seen change in the marketing aspect over the years of the property? Um. Well, I, th I think there's more to, more changes happening now, but I, I think the best way to sell a house is still as soon as you've got that signed contract, phone your buyers. I think that's still the best way, because if uh, if a buyer hears your excited voice on the phone, plugging it to them, then that's going to that's going to really help. I want to investigate go off on a tangent, but I want to investigate these groups. You can now set up on Instagram because it allows you to essentially. And I've got a few American real estate agent friends and they're doing it already. Like it allows you to release stock through this kind of this this group really just to um, wet the whistle of those buyers that have chose to be in that. Um, so I, I, I expect that that might have a part to play. The tricky thing is when you're trying to produce amazing reels and things like that, you can't do them quickly. There's no, there's no way of getting them turned around within a day. So I think the best form of marketing is still knowing your database and phone your buyers as soon as you can. Um, speaking to your parties that have got property to sell. So they feel like they're getting a really good, um, service from you because if they're going to sell theirs they're going to want to use you if you can find them something that's suitable um portals are portals let's be honest you have to pop them up on there but really should have the buyers lining up before they even get to the portals and our and our reels and those those productions that we're doing i think that's more for the company's visibility than anything else it just shows people what we can do um we are properties that have been on the market for some time we are getting inquiries off properties that are essentially gone through the normal routes, the right moves and stuff and didn't get the, the right inquiry. So it does it does lead to some um, opportunities, but it's 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 not a banker to get your view in. So okay. good old fashioned, get on the phone. That's the way to do it. I couldn't agree more. Make it your best friend. So you talked about um, communication and obviously you talked about the markets very different to how it was in COVID. So um, how have you managed to train install in that to your colleagues? that they have to speak to people now they have to pick up the phone they have to make it happen yeah i mean i i, I really do not crack record but i really do hammer home the urgency because buyers can get distracted now with new instructions and bits and pieces so you've really got to be 
and it's it's just an attitude change really i think we were probably all quite quite happy with being able to send in the details and then they'll call you back but 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 now it's like look i don't want to send you the details i've got another three people that are going to go and view it come and see it with me now um we're fortunate with our office locations. We always kind of planned them so people weren't parking around the corner in NCPs where they'd be worrying about um, getting the car out and all those bits and pieces. We wanted to make it so convenient and easy they could just jump in the car and go. Um, so I think I, th I think that kind of urgency across the phone needs to be there. Um, we were doing live streams. You probably will remember we were doing live streams um, during that time when you had 20 or 30 people wanting to view a house. We've had to adapt that now. You don't have that kind of that many people trying to view houses. So we've gone back to trying to be available for the client at their their right time scale. Um, I think it might come from one of your probably did come from you, actually. The chap that the Australian chap that we um, that you did some sessions with. Troy. Um, Troy. Not Troy. Troy. Daniel Spencer. Daniel Spencer. I think he suggested listing on one day. Yeah. And so we have, it wasn't his main feature. It was just something that, and it resonated with me. And, and we as a company ever since have done, we list on a Tuesday. And the reason we list on a Tuesday, we actually now added in Thursdays, but we list on a Tuesday because it allows us as a busy company to get back into a routine and a cycle. So we know from a launch, a launch on a Tuesday on a right move camp like um, portal will lead to them viewings that can take place on the Saturday. But it also means for our hub, for our team and administration centre, they can get everything teed up. And they, if it's not done by like Monday, it's not going to get live on Tuesday. We're not rushing anything through. Um, but as a company, that, that was revolutionary, revolutionary for us. And the reason that Daniel said to do it is because if you are a company that's got a good profile in your patch, then that whole deluge of stock on one day, you can't miss you. Like you're really, really quite busy. OK, you're going to be quiet for the rest of the week, but you just it's really impactful. So. Yeah, we've been doing that for two and a half years and it's been one of our best things. I think all the staff, for, for many different reasons, they all prefer us to be in a routine like that so that we all know what the what the state of play is. So that's really interesting because I wrote down just a couple minutes before that to ask you about implementation because I know Matt Nicholl is Mr. Implementer. Maybe after Sean Adams, the two of you are in competition. I've heard he's taken my mantle, yeah. He can have it. <laughs> but... Um, You've taken action. You've been on the training course, so you've invested in yourself firstly. Um, you've invested in your team, I know, quite a few times to send them on various training courses. But more importantly, you take action. Why? Why? And what, we don't and, what, and what do you think stops the other people from taking action? I mean, it's great um, for you. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still, I mean, I've, I've got a coach now and I was on a five hour webinar on Friday afternoon because my coach is in America. And so it's not, you know, something that I can easily um, access in my kind of normal working hours. But um, I, I, I strongly feel that there's there's always tweaks and improvements. Um, I probably only got as good as I feel I kind of am because I've always been learning. Um, I think I've, I've, I've always had an open mind to it. I listen to podcasts regularly. Um, I do make sure I'm keeping on top of books. I don't read, I listen to audibles, but I, I, I'm, you know, absorbing that information and implementation. My staff know that there's flexibility. If it's not right for the team and there's feedback, that means it's not worked out for us. We can tweak and change it, but you never know until you try it. And there's loads of things that we've done over the years that haven't worked and we've gone back and that's fine. But there's a lot of real positives as a result of being open minded to having those um, those tweaks and changes. Um, we give them dedicated time every month. So they get um, two sessions, two sit down sessions to have some dedicated personal development time. And that's as easy as it is. I mean, if you're a manager or a director of a business, then just give your staff that little bit of time, you know, get them to listen to some podcasts, get them to go and do an able agent training course, get them to have some advice and tips from Stephen Brown. You know, there's there's plenty out there that people can do to absorb it. I think Rightmove has a hub section where you can get training from as well. I think you're on the kerfuffle training courses. You know, there's, there's loads out there. You just need to say to your staff member, leave your phone with me, take a laptop into that room, and you've got an hour dedicated to yourself. Go and learn something. Um, and... Mia, the, my colleague that we've just done the valuation training with, when we were talking about what makes us different to other agents, she said, she said, I don't think as many agents have got a, as many MNAEAs and CLAPs and stuff like that. There's there's not as many 
agents locally who actually done that self investment and those qualifications. So it's um, it's nice to know that the staff kind of feel like it's a it's a positive thing to be doing as well. My tips in the morning, they're 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 the simplest little bits, but it's implementable stuff. It could be from point of view, right? You all walk in through the kitchen door to your office. Have you gone in through the front door and considered what it looks like to a consumer? When you come in through the front door at lunchtime, what's it smell like? How much? How much? How hot is it in that office when people come in from the out? Like it's it can be the little bits like that, and you just go the penny just drops, and you can just they just think, oh yeah, that makes sense. Need to need to suss that one out ourselves. Okay, brilliant. Um, you talked about there actually having a, a your own coach and your own mentor. And I want to thank you because I know you've um, done a lot for agents together. So thank you very much for everything you do there. Um, why do you think it's important to have a coach or a mentor and how is that helping you? So I presume you've got one of Tom Ferriss coaches. I have indeed. Yeah, I have a lady called Sandra. Um, she's based in New Mexico City. Um, she knows all the languages in the world. Um, um, so firstly, why do I need to have a coach? It's a, it's a clear thing, you know, all top athletes need a coach. Everyone needs a coach. Even people at the top of their sport need a coach. Then, you know, me as a middle ground estate agent will need someone to kind of keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, I guess personally, I want to know that my business has got the best opportunity to, to do the best it can in its area. So I'm looking for new ideas. And that's why I went out to America, because I didn't want to be doing the same things that other agents are doing in the UK. I wanted to broaden my horizon slightly. Obviously, their process and their market's different to ours. Timescale for their sales blows your mind. The fees they charge blows your mind. But at least it kind of gives you a few new ideas and different perspective on things. But also, it's that accountability. It's about that kind of – I met her once physically, and I'm going back over in February. But um, she she really is in my corner, but also pushing back on me as well. So a lot of people that I kind of work with will kind of never really question what I've done or push back on what I've done, whereas she can. And that's really what I want. I don't, I don't want a yes, sir, no, sir. And I, I, I want someone who's going to go, yeah, but why are you saying it that way? What what does that actually mean? So um, I do feel having that coach, it keeps me on my toes, probably for want of a better word. Good. A um, couple of final questions, if that's OK with you. Sure um you do amazing work in your community um you know and i obviously know you're rooted in rooted in your community memorable for all the right reasons um what made you decide to become that community agent and you know share some of the stuff that you do because i think it's absolutely incredible so it it just feels natural now actually and i think my kind of purpose for the business and my staff kind of started to see this already is I need to get myself some time back because what really kind of floats my boat and ticks the boxes for me is doing stuff in the community. I'm not, I'm not out valuing anymore. Obviously I support and I consult and those bits and pieces, but, but I, I get, I get a buzz out of doing something in our local area. So I'm now um, chairman of the thing called the place board. Um, the place board is a group. Um, it's like an advisory panel to the district council that's local to us. So um, we have, UK shared prosperity fund um, money that we can use and we are to spend. We had £200,000 at the beginning of last year. I got bought in about eight months ago. Um, but the point for us is that we do advise which Haven District Council on where our Droit Rich Town Centre and the area could be developed. And there was a prospectus that listed everything that we've got as assets and things that we can we could work with. Um, and I thoroughly enjoy it. It's not a paid job. And that's the funny thing. I get more reward out of that than I do anything really at the moment because I can see positive impact. We've had Christmas lights that we've organised on the high street. We've got a plan for a health corridor, which will be taking a long stretch along the canal towpath in Droitwich. And I'm I'm walking that stretch a number of times with different people that are quoting for the work and I'm meeting with parish councils, but I just thoroughly enjoy it. And look, there's, there's no doubt it'll probably be good for the business in some way, shape or form at some point, but it's never going to be the driving force um one of your um nephews and myself we we have a plan for an easter egg trail that we do at droitwich cricket pitch and that's always a very very positive experience we did the big worcestershire garage sale last year which we'll be doing again this year and that's getting planned in at the moment um and then we've also got a community fund that we donate 100 pounds of our um fee upon completion 
to the choice of the vendor basically so if they choose a their school that their son goes to or a charity or community project whatever it needs to be we give a hundred pounds back to it so I, I I take I take a lot of enjoyment out of that that's kind of where I am now and I and I want the business if I'm honest with you to flourish without me I need it to be able to work without me being around I know I need to be involved still but I, I want it to work without me because at 40 years now and going up I I want to kind of go right what can I do in my hometown that's going to really benefit and the community you know Worcester and Malvern there's some cracking little opportunities there that we could help out with as well so um yeah, I get quite passionate about the community bit. That's 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 my bag now. That's where I want to be. Okay, well, it's amazing, and you know, you've been doing it for years. It's not just a one-off. You know, I know how much you sponsor the cricket team, the football team, the rugby team. There, um, I know you've transformed. I think it was Joy for, but I can't remember the swimming pool area or around there. Or yeah, the Park. Yeah, two thousand fourteen. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what you've done is absolutely incredible. So you should be incredibly proud. And I'm sure everybody in Droywich um, appreciates exactly what you do. It's amazing. It's well done you. Thank you. It's enjoyable I, stuff. I, I, I genuinely think that's anyone that's got a business or a profile in their hometown or city, just just put your hand up because you'll you'll love it. You'll thoroughly enjoy it. So final question. Who inspires Matt Nichol? Oh, who inspires Matt Nichol? Um, I, I feel my capacity for work and my drive to work hard is probably from my dad, Richard, who now works yeah. in the company. He's our group finance director. Um, yeah. I remember, I remember growing up watching him always working all the hours God sends, and I and I and I do try not to be that you know guy sat on the sofa with my laptop anymore but um and I've, and I've i've won that battle that's great but who inspires me i think i think i i i take a lot from people like simon sinek um tom ferry i think is a is a good is a good guide um i'm hoping to get on a podcast with him in february when i go out to the elite retreat that's a big hairy amb ambitious goal that one um no, you've, well, you've stopped. He's been on mine. Just ask him. Ask. I will. Well, we're, we're starting the process. Me and my coach are already starting the process. Um, we, we do communicate, but uh, yeah, to, to get a podcast out of him is going to be a bit of a bold one. So, um, yeah, yeah I mean, say again. Persevere. Yes, ask, I will. Ask, 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 and ask, and ask, and ask. Yeah, we're we 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 we're putting the wheels in motion. There's um there's hopefully a game of golf when I get out there, so that will be the start of the process as well. Have a have a crack at that. I've swerved your question. Um, I I I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say there's anyone that I can kind of say it's because of that person. I I think I take a lot from others, and um you know, you talk about some of the good that I do with your um computers for schools campaign things like that, mate. There those are brilliant as well. Everyone's out there trying to do their best, aren't they? I think that's that's the important thing. Um, and it's definitely having a positive impact. You remember probably when I started out as agents, we used to have a really, really poor reputation, the way the fast show used to portray us. Um, you know, like like car salespeople, no offense to car salespeople, but but we 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 were deep we were deemed to be a very um low quality trade. But actually I think that that's had a revolution, really. I think often the agents one of the most favored in their community nowadays with the work that they do and the things that they're they're achieving so um and that's that's a real positive it's it's something to you know be very proud of i think 100 percent. so matt how do people find you get hold of you if they want to get in touch um so instagram matt underscore the underscore agent i've gone simple uh drop me an email matt with two t's at nickelandco.co.uk and yeah, I'd, I'd say social media is probably the best way to find me out. And uh, if you want to follow Nickel and Co Estate Agents as well, you can see what we're up to on a daily basis. One thing I've done today is I've actually, and I put it on my my LinkedIn, I've come off our Facebook page today. So I'm no longer in the background an administrator or anything on our Facebook page, which is after 14 and a half years, a big feeling. <laughs> it's, it's it's massive. Good. So who's got who's got that job? We've got a marketing manager, a content creator, a VA in Manila, and a couple of other staff members. So it, it's in good hands, but I've always kind of had, you know, a, a part to play, but I kind of feel like 
I just don't need to I don't need to be tinkering anymore I can leave those guys to it so very exciting times ahead Fantastic. so enjoy your night off and yeah. we'll see how long, <laughs> we'll we'll long, we'll see how long morning. yeah we'll see how long it lasts <laughs> Matt thank you so much um for being a wonderful guest um well done on all your awards and everything that you're doing in Droitwich and I'm sure in Worcester and Melbourne. Um, incredible. It's been brilliant to follow your journey and I look forward to seeing the further successes and, and continued growth because I know for one thing's for sure, you will not not stand still. No, 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 no. I might I might I might be pushing others up to the to the front in the power pit, but uh no, we won't we won't stop what we're doing. Brilliant. Well look, thank you. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. Really appreciate it. And please like it, share it and get the podcast out there. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks, Stephen.